know you. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. You're that jaywalking punk anarchist. Jaywalking punk anarchist. Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, City Light Books, 2018. The key idea of this text is to take a critical look at the history of the Second Amendment, taking us from the slave patrols and rangers stealing native lands, to the modern rise of reactionaries, the alt-right, modern imperialism, and mass shooters. Or as Dunbar Ortiz explains it, in the pages ahead, I explore various ways in which a dangerous gun culture has emerged in the United States. One that has entitled white nationalism, racialized dominance, and social control through violence. This book is a history of the Second Amendment's connection to that culture and a reflection of how the violence it has spawned has deeply influenced the character of the United States. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Introduction, Gun Love. The introduction covers Dunbar Ortiz's personal history with firearms in the 1970s. She states, after a week of heavy police surveillance, we began receiving telephone calls from a man claiming to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. The man threatened to burn down our building, and of course, we didn't trust the police, so we didn't report it. Instead, we decided to arm ourselves. This anecdote serves to argue that Dunbar Ortiz isn't just some scared-of-guns-never-touched-a-gun-in-her-life type person, but she has experience with gun ownership. I think it is an important fact about her to keep in mind going forward. Chapter 1. Historical Context of the Second Amendment This chapter argues that the Second Amendment had two goals. One, to allow settlers to control the slave population with guns. And two, to allow settlers to fight indigenous populations with guns and steal their land. Dunbar Ortiz describes the Rangers stating, Violent encroachment on those outside the colonial boundaries raged, and illegal speculation in stolen Indian lands was rampant. In the southern colonies especially, farmers who had lost their land in competition with larger, more efficient slave work plantations rushed for native farmlands over the mountain range. These militant settlers, rangers, thus created the framework for the United States to appropriate native territories and attempt to eradicate indigenous nations across the continent for the following century. Dunbar Ortiz then explains that this theft of land was maintained through ordinances that allowed for westward expansion, as well as laws in the colonies which mandated gun ownership. The advent of U.S. independence guaranteed westward expansion, and this meant an increase in both the taking of native lands as well as an expansion of slavery, both of which meant an increased need for armed citizens. Chapter 2. Savage War Here Dunbar Ortiz gives a history of U.S. war with indigenous nations. Dunbar Ortiz explains that the wars against the Native Americans were some of the first uses of total war, meaning not just soldiers fighting other soldiers, but soldiers fighting all aspects of the other society, destroying homes, destroying food sources, killing men, women, children, and the elderly. Discussing scout bounties, Dunbar Ortiz states, During the Pequot War, Connecticut and Massachusetts colonial officials had offered bounties initially for the heads of murdered indigenous people and later for only the scalps, which were more portable in large numbers. Every single territory and subsequent state of the United States, with the exceptions of Alaska and Hawaii, at some point in their history, promulgation, that is, of a policy that said that a citizen producing the scalp, and in some cases the bloody red skin, of an adult male Indian would be paid if you take Pennsylvania Colony and say 1740 as an example, the equivalent of the annual wage of your average farmer for that proof of death of an Indian, male, any Indian, male, didn't matter who, killed simply on basis of membership and group, matter of official policy. 40 pounds sterling, that's the equivalency of the annual wage. Adult female Indian, 20 pounds sterling, killed two women, annual wage. 10 pounds sterling for a child. Child be defined as any human being of either sex under 12 years of age down to and including fetus. And there are cases on record where professional scalp hunters did kill pregnant women, open their bellies, scalp the fetus, collect twice. This was a profession. And Indians were being hunted and killed as a matter of policy throughout the Anglo-American portion of North America for several centuries. 
Dunbar Ortiz then talks about three major factors involving early U.S. imperialism. Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears, the Texas Rangers and the invasion and annexation of half of Mexico, and the Marines and early U.S. interventionism. Chapter 3, Slave Patrols. This chapter is, of course, about U.S. slave patrols. Dumbo Ortiz starts by explaining that our modern police state has its roots in the slave patrols. She then gives a brief history of slave patrols such as states requiring gun ownership, requiring that people carry passes to move from place to place, and slave catchers using horses and dogs and guns to round up runaway slaves. And things only got worse after slavery. As Dunbar Ortiz explains it, the freedmen no longer even had the protection of being valued as property and collateral by former slavers, allowing for extreme forms of revenge violence against them. She then explains that white farmers formed agricultural cooperatives to intimidate and force out black farmers, and there was also widespread violent terrorism against the black community, propagated by militia groups and rifle clubs, and other terrorist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. Regarding the Klan, Dunbar Ortiz states, The Klan, illegal as it was, operated like a huge slave patrol, requiring freedmen to have written permission to travel from the plantations where many continued to work, the Klan established curfews for a gathering of African Americans, as well as limits on the number who could gather. The Klan burned homes, confiscated guns from freedmen, and of course inflicted punishment similar to slave patrols beatings, but also had more freedom to torture and murder since the black body no longer carried monetary value that the murderer would have to compensate for. Dumbo Ortiz explains that with the KKK and terror against black people in the South, many black people began moving north to cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland. Now keep in mind, these were folks who moved far away from where they were from and probably did not have a lot of prospects as far as lacking education and having limited access to job opportunities or some kind of savings account to fall back on. And on top of this, they were now fighting for employment opportunities against families, particularly white families, who were already living in those cities. All this leads to increased racism against black people and racial bias in society in the form of restricting access to job opportunities, education, and housing, for example. And with all this, the police in those cities began to resemble the slave patrols of the South. Chapter 4, Confederate Guerrillas to Outlaw Icons This chapter is about our Robin Hood outlaws and cowboy heroes who were actually slave catchers and murderers of Native Americans. To start, Dunbar Ortiz discusses the remakes of popular outlaw songs from the 50s to the 70s. She then discusses movies which popularized Wild West characters. The problem with this is of course the sanitizing of, the celebrating of, and justification of characters involved in oppression and racism. Or as Dunbar Ortiz explains, And so began the long 20th century of endless U.S. wars, covert and open, with a distinct revival of gun glorification and a recasting of the personalities of brutal pro-slavery guerrillas as outlaw heroes, the influence of which continues to spill over into the present. Wait a minute. Spill over into the present? That reminds me. Um, I, I can't, um, I can't remember. Wild West, cowboys in the south, it sounds so familiar. Chapter 5. Myth of the Hunter. This chapter is about the lone wilderness hunter myth about a white man conquering the so-called untamed wilderness, which were actually native lands. Stories like Last of the Mohicans, Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and others. As Dunbar Ortiz puts it, what Daniel Boone, like George Washington, was up to was intruding upon sovereign native land so as to covertly survey it and sell it to white settlers who would then form themselves into militias to murder the families who had been living there for generations. Some were successful and grew rich and powerful, such as George Washington, while others, like Boone, never attained wealth, his land speculations resulting in bankruptcy. And Dunbar Ortiz concludes, The central role that the myth of the hunter continues to play in Americana is to perpetuate the contemporary romance with firearms and justification for the sacredness of the Second Amendment, eclipsing the fact that this was a capitalist enterprise carried out through atrocities of violence, territorial theft, and mass displacement, not an adventure. 
wait a minute. Mass displacement, atrocities of violence, not an adventure. Wait, that's it. Not an adventure, spilling over into the present. The theft of lands, scout, scout bounties, lynching, downplaying and omitting and coverting it all into a consumable romantic adventure, thus whitewashing and sanitizing the brutal history. Well, I guess I've played into it as well. Chapter 6, The Second Amendment as a Covenant. This chapter is about the U.S. interpretation of the Second Amendment as sacred. This chapter starts by explaining Calvinism and Manifest Destiny as justifications for white domination of native lands. Dunbar Ortiz then discusses several Supreme Court cases regarding the Second Amendment. United States v. Kirkshank, which argued that the right to bear arms is not guaranteed by the Constitution. United States v. Miller, which ruled that the federal government and states could limit any weapon type with regulation. And District of Columbia v. Heller, which held that the Second Amendment did guarantee the right of the individual to keep and bear arms. Dunbar Ortiz then discusses the John Birch Society and the Reagan and Bush presidencies and the rise of the modern right-wing reactionary movement. She explains, During the period 1954-64, to following the use of nuclear weapons against Japan and a stalemated proxy war between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China and Korea, national liberation movements arose in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, most succeeding in evicting French, Belgian, Dutch, Portuguese, and British colonizers from their countries. While these movements inspired activists, African Americans, Puerto Ricans, indigenous peoples, Chicanos, and Asian Americans, as well as white anti-imperialist and anti-war activists and students, they had the opposite effect on those who feared the loss of white supremacy in the United States and the loss of U.S. supremacy in the world and among the elites who feared loss of confidence in capitalism. And Dunbar Ortiz concludes, The Constitution is the sacred text of the civic religion that is U.S. nationalism, and that nationalism is inexorably tied to white supremacy. Chapter 7. Mass Shootings this chapter follows the trajectory that is the anti-civil rights movement transitioning to focusing on crime and law and order. See the term racist dog whistle. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. This led to increased vigilante justice and owning a gun for protection from criminals, which was followed by an increase in mass shooters. This chapter argues similar to the movie Bowling for Columbine, asking if there are parallels between U.S. internal violence and U.S. violence abroad, between gang violence and U.S. support of death squads abroad. In case you weren't aware, the U.S. has sponsored death squads in countries like Iraq and Mozambique and Syria and El Salvador and Brazil and Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras and many others. And also, are there parallels between mass shootings in the U.S. and U.S. interventionism abroad? Which, again, if you didn't know, the U.S. has invaded a few countries, and not just the ones you tend to think of, Vietnam, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. No, the U.S. has invaded countless countries. The U.S. has invaded over 70 countries since World War II alone. Dunbar Ortiz admits that there is no way to prove a correlation between war crimes, the U.S. bombing of civilian populations and their infrastructure, and domestic mass shootings, but the relationship does not appear to be random. She continues, The history of public mass shootings by a lone gunman killing or wounding strangers is important to trace as they parallel the rise of the gun rights movement and ramped up militarism. Dunbar Ortiz then goes through a history of some of the most prominent mass shootings, such as the Marine Sniper at the University of Texas in 1966, the McDonald's shooting in California in 1984, the Luby's Cafeteria shooting in Texas in 1991, the Columbine High School shooting in 1999, the Red Lake Nation shooting in 2005, the Virginia Tech University shooting in 2007, the Sandy Hook 
Elementary shooting in 2012, the Pulse nightclub shooting in 2016, and the Vegas shooting in 2017. And Dunmore Ortiz concludes, We had prominent Democratic Party officials, including Barack Obama, in an eight-year presidency urgently calling for gun regulations and banning some weapons in the United States, while fully supporting the unlimited production of bombs, bombers, and drones to kill people on a daily basis. Since 1990, there has been no serious political effort to reduce the Defense Department budget. Yet in response to mass shootings, no money can be found to finance mental health facilities, mental health problems being one attribute that nearly all the mass shooters share. Essentially, if we want to stop the killing, the simple solution would be to take even a fraction of the almost $700 billion military budget, which is responsible for murdering civilians all over the world, and use some of that money to revamp our mental health system, which could help us solve the problem of mass shootings at home. I'm so sick of arming the world and then sending troops over to destroy the fucking arms. You know what I mean? We keep arming these little countries, then we go and blow the shit out of them. We're like the bullies of the world, you know? We're like Jack Palance in the movie Shane, throwing the pistol at the sheep herder's feet. Pick it up. I don't want to pick it up, mister. You'll shoot me. Pick up the gun. <laughs> you all saw him. He had a gun. <laughs> Chapter 8. White Nationalism, the Militia Movement, and the Tea Party Patriots. This chapter covers the rise of white nationalist groups and militias. Dunbar Ortiz discusses Trump's demonizing of Muslims and Mexicans and the support he receives from white nationalists. She also looks at the rise of the alt-right in general and the Unite the Right rally and the killing of Heather Heyer. Dunbar Ortiz walks us through this history, starting with the Reagan-era reactionaries. As Reagan's free market economic and anti-union policies, accompanied by rapid deindustrialization and job shrinkage, produced homelessness and insecurity for the most vulnerable, they also increasingly affected white workers, making them easy prey to white nationalists and politicized evangelical groups that had their own narrative about the cause. Big government, including mysterious black helicopters, secularization, banks, always implicating Jews, poverty programs, always identified with African Americans even though the majority of recipients were in fact white, and Mexican migrants and women taking their jobs. Like the previous chapter comparing mass shootings and military violence, Dunbar Ortiz discusses the military violence of the Reagan years, including the invasion of Grenada, supporting death squads in Angola and Mozambique in Nicaragua, and supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and supporting of apartheid in South Africa, and comparing all of this to the growth of hate groups in the U.S. from this era onward, such as the Aryan Nations, the Posse Comitatus, the Order, and the Patriots. Dumbo Ortiz connects the rise of these groups and their goals with the rise of anti-government pro-capitalist groups and individuals, such as the Cato Institute, the Koch brothers, Ron Paul, Freedom Works, Americans for Prosperity, the Tea Party, the Wide Use Movement, and others. Dumbo Ortiz then discusses white supremacists infiltrating law enforcement in various branches of the military, and giving anecdotes such as a police station where lockers were filled with white power graffiti, and a police officer being fired for ties to the KKK. And Dunbar Ortiz states, The steep rise in white nationalist groups between 2008 and 2014 grew from 149 to nearly 1,000, which paralleled the rise in police shootings of black men. Leaders of black men's movement against crack in New York were spied on, harassed, arrested, and convicted of illegal possession of weapons, attempted escape, and assault charges they repeatedly denied. Native American Indian activists Timothy Jacobs and Eddie Hatcher took over a Robeson County, North Carolina newspaper office one day to bring attention to rampant police corruption, drug dealing, racism, and murder by officials. Tried in federal court for kidnapping, they were acquitted. 
tried again for the same action in state court, they were sentenced to prison for 25-year terms. There is the case of the Crips leader in Los Angeles, Dwayne Holmes, who brought peace between the gangs in L.A. and who was caught on trumped-up charges. Uh, some provocateurs came to a community event that he was sponsoring and said that he stole $10. Twenty witnesses said he did no such thing, and Dwayne Holmes was sentenced to and is now serving seven years in prison for this $10 theft, which he never committed. Prison inmates who propagate anti-capitalist or black nationalist views or Latino nationalist or Puerto Rican nationalist views who engage in prison protests have been singled out for mind control programs. Prisoners like the socialist Stephen Kessler, charged with disrupting a federal pen penitentiary by, quote, promoting racial unity, collectivizing the inmate population, attempting to secure legislative inquiries into prison conditions, and being involved with outside radical groups. Now, all those things I thought were part of his democratic rights and sounded like some pretty good things, too, promoting racial unity. But instead, Kessler, for his efforts, was placed in a behavior modification unit to be subjected to mind-altering drugs, beatings, forced rectal searches, prolonged shackling, isolation, and other tortures. In the words of one Oklahoma prisoner, quote, as long as prisoners confine themselves to gambling, shooting dope, running loan rackets, and killing each other, everything is fine. Let them pick up a book on Marxist theory, and they are immediately branded a communist agitator and locked in solitary confinement. Dunbar Ortiz then discusses the Black Panther Party and the crackdown against gun rights that soon followed. She states, Across the country, federal and state authorities coordinated efforts to target, disrupt, and destroy the organization, and in some cases, engage in assassination, as in the coordinated killing of charismatic Black Panther leader Fred Hampton. From 1968 to 1971, police attacked the headquarters of the Black Panther Party, a Marxist revolutionary organization, in more than 10 cities. By the way, the Black Panther Party also was involved in breakfast programs, community help programs, and the like. In more than 10 cities, the police wrecked their offices, stole thousands of dollars in funds, and arrested, beat, and shot occupants in planned, unprovoked attacks coordinated with the FBI attacks in which more than 40 Panthers were murdered by police in that period, including Chicago leader, Panther leader Fred Hampton, who was shot dead while asleep in his bed. The suppression of community activists is a form of counterinsurgency, a way of keeping people victimized. Dumbo Ortiz concludes, White nationalists are the irregular forces, the volunteer militias, of the actually existing political economic order. They are provided for in the Second Amendment. In various cities, secret police units, commonly known as Red Squads, spy on and harass lawful advocacy groups, sometimes poking into the private lives of public figures to embarrass or pressure them out of public life. Red Squads have monitored hundreds of thousands of individuals and organizations. Perhaps one reason authorities cannot win the war on crime and the war against drugs quote, quote, is that they're too busy fighting the war against political dissent. Chapter 9, Eluding and Resisting the Second Amendment's Historical Connection to White Supremacy. This chapter essentially looks at other authors' explanations for U.S. gun culture and critiquing them, and explaining how the explanation for U.S. gun culture given in this text is the correct one. Dunbar Ortiz concludes the chapter with an argument that's essentially summarizing the entire text. Any assessment of gun violence in the Second Amendment in the United States is incomplete or skewed without dealing with what the guns were for, and, given what they were for, what that means for their popularity and proliferation today. The United States created its armed forces and police to carry out a genocidal policy against Native peoples, seize Native land, and control African Americans, which continues to this day in other forms, including police shooting unarmed black men and incarcerating a large percentage of them. Conclusion History is not past. To start the conclusion, Dunbar Ortiz states, Polls have long shown support for restrictions on gun sales and use, as well as support for background checks at gun shows. By 2016, nearly two-thirds of those polled favored stricter laws and a majority even supported nationwide bans on the sale of semi-automatic weapons such as the AR-15, and on the sale of magazines holding more than 10 bullets. 
Dembo Ortiz then discusses the success of regulations in Australia and asking why it is that reactionary forces in the U.S. have been able to hold off similar regulations in the U.S. despite the public wanting it. And Dembo Ortiz concludes, The elephant in the room in these debates has long been what the armed militias of the Second Amendment were used for, destroying native communities in the armed march to possess the continent and brutal subjugation of enslaved African populations that is, the control of land and people and using them disposably for profit. All these sacred sites and public lands must be returned to the stewardship of the native nations, from which they were illegally seized. None should be privatized. And Dunbortes closes, quoting Ice-T, who stated, You'll never have justice on stolen land. Conclusion the message of the text is clear, the purpose of the Second Amendment was for stealing native land and for policing slaves. From the fear of slave revolts in the colonies to the fear of the black criminal today, the purpose and the fight for the Second Amendment has existed on racial lines. I, however, don't see a conclusion laid out in the text. Dunbar Ortiz discusses regulation and how public opinion polls show that the U.S. favors regulation, and then she looks at Australian gun regulations as an example before briefly talking about reparations for Native Americans. Now, the reparations thing I have no problem with. The U.S. invasion of Pine Ridge in the 1970s and the recent U.S. invasion into Standing Rock certainly demonstrate that the U.S. war against Native populations isn't over and needs to be stopped. The regulation thing, on the other hand, I do have problems with. Now, I've made my stance on the gun debate clear in the past. I completely believe in the ownership of a firearm as means for self-protection. But let's bring this back to the text. We've just concluded a text explaining that, with the tacit and active support of the U.S. government, armed white gangs were used to hunt down and kill Native Americans and black people and that the FBI was used to assassinate people on the political left, such as the Black Panther Party. And then we read about how the military and the police have been infiltrated with white supremacists. These groups won't face gun regulation. Not only this, but when the right wing says, if you take away guns, only bad guys will have guns, I, I tend to believe this. Though I'm not thinking of gangs in the inner city, I'm thinking about armed fascists and right wing militias. When it comes to politics, gun regulations have been and will continue to be disproportionately applied to the left. Our response should not be to promote regulation, instead we should promote the protection of marginalized and threatened communities. What should we do about armed right-wing militias? Socialists, communists, and anarchists need to be able to defend themselves. What should we do about armed fascists? People of color, migrants, and LGBTQ plus people need to be able to defend themselves. All that said, the text as a whole does exactly what it says it does. It provides a thorough history of the Second Amendment's racist implementation and the racist use from the arming of slave patrols and rangers of the colonial period to the arming of right-wing and fascist militias today. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical reviews here with the Radical Review. Thanks for watching. So all my soldiers in the place, put your guns in the air And raise up your fists if you really do care If you're sick of the world, where nothing is fair And you can't drink the water or breathe in the air If you're sick of watching children get beat by the cops Seeing friends get harassed cause they sport and dreadlocks Kill the type of motherfucker that's known to take shots Not in bars but in cars, park the donut shops Rip shots in the air